If Buddhism is compatible with science, then why do so many scientists still ignore it? And if it's not, why are neuroscientists quoting the Buddha in TED Talks? Can a 2,500-year-old spiritual path really align with quantum physics, brain scans, and the scientific method? This isn't a video for people who want to believe. This is for people who want to understand. I'm Silent Flame, and today we dive into one of the most urgent, electrifying questions in modern spirituality. Is Buddhism compatible with science, or is that just a comforting illusion? We live in an age where telescopes see galaxies dying and microscopes see thoughts firing, and somewhere in the middle, a monk sits in silence, eyes closed, watching his breath. What does he know that machines don't? What can science prove about stillness, suffering, and self? Some say Buddhism is the most scientific religion ever created. Others say it's still a system of faith, just better branded. So what's the truth? Let's find out. What is science? Before we compare Buddhism and science, we need to stop pretending we know what either one actually means. Science is not a set of facts. It is a method, a way of asking questions and testing answers. It is built on skepticism, observation, repeatability, falsifiability. It doesn't deal in ultimate truths. It builds models and waits for them to break. At its core, science is humility turned into method. What is Buddhism? Buddhism, too, is not a fixed system. It's not a single doctrine or god or prophet. It's a set of practices and insights explored, adapted, and expanded over millennia. The earliest teachings of the Buddha were not about creation, divine judgment, or supernatural intervention. They were about experience, suffering, mind, freedom. The Buddha didn't say, believe. He said, come and see for yourself. That sounds suspiciously scientific. What is science? Before we compare Buddhism and science, we need to stop pretending we know what either one actually means. Science is not a set of facts. First, observation of internal experience. Science studies the external. Buddhism studies the internal. But both rely on observation. In meditation, the practitioner becomes a lab. Thoughts are observed like data points. Sensations are tracked like signals. Reactions are examined like chemical processes. The Buddha said, In this fathom-long body, I declare the world, the origin of the world, the cessation of the world, and the path leading to its cessation. That's phenomenology, before the word existed. 2. Mindfulness and neuroplasticity. Modern neuroscience now confirms what ancient monks practiced. That sustained attention, mindfulness, literally reshapes the brain, increases gray matter, improves emotional regulation, reduces anxiety and chronic pain. John Kabat-Zinn's MBSR, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, is used in hospitals around the world. Thousands of fMRI scans show changes in the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex, and the default mode network. The idea that the mind can observe itself and transform is no longer mystical, it's measurable. 3. The illusion of self. Buddhism teaches anatta, no permanent self. Modern neuroscience teaches that you are a pattern of processes not a fixed thing. There is no central eye in the brain, no control center, just distributed networks constantly updating. This idea, once radical, is now echoed in scientific research from Harvard, Oxford, and the Human Connectum Project. So when the Buddha said, the self is an illusion, and a neuroscientist says, the ego is a model, are they saying the same thing? in different languages. Let's be honest. It's easy to quote mindfulness studies and say, see, Buddhism is science approved. 
But that's only part of the truth. Because Buddhism isn't just about calm minds and lowered blood pressure. It's about karma, rebirth, enlightenment, non-physical realms. And here, science doesn't just disagree. It stays silent or it walks away. First, rebirth. Buddhism teaches rebirth, not as metaphor, but as literal reality, not just once, but over and over until enlightenment. The idea is not that you come back, but that your intentions, your karma, ripple forward and manifest a new experience. Science, meanwhile, has no evidence for life after death, no measurement for karma, no peer-reviewed proof of reincarnated consciousness. In scientific terms, when brain activity ceases, experience ends. End of story. So how can a system rooted in empirical data accept a doctrine built on what happens after death? 2. Karma. Karma, in its original form, is not what goes around comes around. It's the law of cause and effect, shaped by intention. Every thought, action, word, seeds future experience. But again, science can't track this. There's no machine to scan karmic imprints, no algorithm that calculates moral weight. Psychology may observe patterns, sociology may infer consequences. But karma, as Buddhists describe it, includes multiple lifetimes and unseen consequences. So can science ever validate it? Or is karma forever outside the microscope? 3. Enlightenment. Now we reach the deepest point. Enlightenment, nirvana, the cessation of suffering, craving, identity, the direct realization of emptiness, non-duality, ultimate reality. Science doesn't know what to do with this. It can scan meditating brains, measure gamma waves, record lowered cortisol. But what does it mean to wake up? What is awakening in neural terms? Is it a brain state, a collapse of default mode activity, or is it something beyond all empirical categories? The Buddha claimed enlightenment is direct, irreversible, and beyond description. Science by design is skeptical of anything it can't test or falsify. Karl Popper, the philosopher of science, said, if a theory can't be proven wrong, it's not science. This is called falsifiability. So let's apply that test. Can we falsify karma? Can we falsify rebirth? Can we falsify enlightenment? In strict terms, no. These are metaphysical claims. They lie beyond the scope of empirical disproof. But here's the twist. So do many scientific theories at first. Black holes were once speculative. Quantum entanglement sounded mystical. Multiverse theories are still untestable. Yet they're explored because they offer coherent models based on observed phenomena. So the real question is not, can we prove rebirth with a lab coat? The real question is, is it a coherent model of reality, internally consistent, experientially reliable, and ethically impactful. Neuroscientists have scanned the brains of advanced meditators. They've found increased gamma activity, suppressed default mode networks, greater cortical thickness in attention areas, and massive changes in emotional reactivity. These findings suggest meditation can transform the brain. But is that enlightenment? Not necessarily. It may be a correlate not a cause, just like a calm lake reflects the moon, but isn't the moon. Real awakening, as described in Buddhist texts, is more than relaxation or focus. It's the collapse of identity, the seeing through of all conceptual construction, the falling away of craving at the root. Science can measure brain waves, but it can't measure freedom from suffering. So unless we expand our understanding of consciousness, we will always mistake the reflection for the thing itself. So is Buddhism compatible with science? On the surface, yes. In mindfulness, attention, emotion, self-regulation, the overlap is profound. At the core, no. 
because Buddhism makes ontological claims about the nature of reality, time, death, and the mind beyond form. Science, meanwhile, restricts itself to the measurable, but the real power is not in agreement, it's in dialogue. Buddhism asks the inner world to be studied like science studies the outer. Science asks Buddhism to offer models, not dogmas, and in the tension between them lies the edge of awakening. Buddhism, especially in its earliest form, was not a theology. It was a psychology long before the word existed. The Buddha didn't begin with believe in this. He began with there is suffering, investigate it. That is the scientific impulse. Observe the data of your life, trace the conditions and change the process. He taught dependent origination, cause and effect within consciousness. He mapped the chain of craving, clinging, becoming. He laid out interventions to break that chain. Cognitive behavioral therapy, habit design, even trauma healing, all follow similar structures today. Observe, understand, reframe, release. So is Buddhism religion or a technology of liberation? The answer is, it depends how you practice it. Write your questions in the comments. You give me a like and a follow. I'll give you an answer. Now let's step into the strange. The emptiness taught in Mahayana Buddhism, Shunyata, sounds suspiciously like quantum physics. Shunyata says, no thing exists independently. Everything arises in dependence on everything else. Form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. Quantum physics says matter is probability, not substance. Observation changes reality. No particle has absolute identity until it's measured. Both are saying the world is not what it seems. There are no fixed entities, only dynamic relationships. Of course, this doesn't mean the Buddha knew about Planck length or wave functions, but it suggests that reality explored through deep awareness or deep math, begins to dissolve at the edges. Science uses language to define, label, and systematize. Buddhism uses language to point beyond itself. The Buddha often refused to answer metaphysical questions, not because he didn't know, but because the questions were malformed. Is the universe eternal or not? Does the Tathagata exist after death or not? He remained silent. Why? Because ultimate truth can't be captured in concepts. To speak of it is to distort it. In quantum physics, we face similar problems. Is light a wave or a particle? Both and neither. It depends how you look. Observation affects outcome. Science meets paradox at its edges. Buddhism begins from paradox and invites you inward. Science thrives on doubt. Buddhism thrives on direct seeing. One says, we don't know, but we're working on it. The other says, you can know, but not with your mind. That's the friction. Science seeks understanding from outside. Buddhism dissolves illusion from inside. And when they meet, something profound can happen. The scientist learns silence, the meditator learns method, and both discover the mind is stranger and more malleable than either expected. Buddhism is not science. Science is not Buddhism, but they share something sacred, the willingness to question appearances. When the Buddha said, don't believe just because it's written, test it for yourself, he spoke like a scientist of suffering. When a physicist says, what we see is not what exists, but what our instruments allow, he sounds like a monk describing illusion. So perhaps the path forward is not merging science and Buddhism, but letting them challenge each other. Science can keep Buddhism honest. Buddhism can remind science of wonder. For centuries, science and spirituality stood on opposite shores. One measured the outer world, the other explored the inner. But now, 
as brain scans reveal the effects of thought, as particles behave like awareness, as psychology begins to admit the limits of self, the shores are moving closer. We dream of unification, of a worldview where quantum fields and karmic winds coexist, where the Higgs boson and Shunyata are different names for the same silence. But that dream is fragile because merging models can blur them and not all wisdom wants to be dissected. And yet, in Tibet, many high lamas eat meat. Why? Because Tibet was an unforgiving climate. Vegetables were rare and survival demanded flexibility. But Vajrayana also introduced a deeper layer, intention over appearance. If one eats meat not for desire, but for nourishment to serve others, the karmic weight may shift. Some Tibetan teachers claim they eat meat with sorrow, mindfulness and prayer, transferring merit to the animal. Is this justification or a sincere ethical attempt to navigate a brutal world? That depends on how honestly you examine your own plate. Science can measure brain waves, hormone levels, behavioral change. But it cannot measure sincerity, insight, stillness. The moment craving dissolves into clarity. You can't fit equanimity in a spreadsheet. You can't put compassion in a test tube. Science studies the surface. Dharma studies the source. You can study the waves forever, but still miss the ocean. The goal is not to make Buddhism scientific or science spiritual. The goal is to let both deepen each other. Let science give Buddhism rigor, clarity of language, evidence, challenge. Let Buddhism give science humility, mystery, morality, meaning. A true practitioner of Dharma doesn't reject science, but doesn't worship it either. They meditate and read. They test and trust. They look outward with reason. They look inward with silence. That balance is not contradiction. It is integration. So is Buddhism compatible with science? Not always, but sometimes where it matters most, they point to the same mystery. Both say, don't trust blindly, test, see, let go of assumptions, face what's real. And if science is the mind's great engine and Buddhism is the heart's great mirror, then perhaps awakening means using both, not to escape the world, but to see it clearly, to act in it wisely and to suffer in it less. I'm silent flame and I don't want you to choose sides. I want you to go so deep into truth that even sides dissolve. Subscribe if you're ready to walk beyond the boundary. Comment below. What do you believe science can never explain? Ooh.